So Jim, as we celebrate your, your ministry in the Lord, um, would you tell us how did it all begin? It began when I was 13 um, at a youth meeting at church after a Sunday service when a church army captain was the speaker and he spoke, I recognised that although I knew all about Christianity, I wasn't a Christian. I needed to be forgiven. So I went home, prayed in my bedroom that the Lord would forgive me. I had a vision in my heart of Jesus dying on the cross and went to sleep, got up the next day and I felt I was a different person. Mm, amazing. And how did that um, manifest into a calling to, to ordained ministry? Well, the vicar that we had was a former missionary. He was in China, had to come out when Mao Zedong took over. And the only parish he could find when he came back with a wife dying of cancer was my home parish, just outside Oldham, a place called Charlton. And so the idea of full-time service was very much to the fore through his actual example. So, Nick, when did you first feel God calling you into ordained ministry? It happened very quickly in the year 1974. I'd just become a Christian. I'd then gone back to university to continue studying engineering, and I'd lost all interest in engineering. And I got great interest in Christian things, and the Christian Union, and the Hall Group, and reading the Bible. And a whole redirection of my life happened during that term. So in January, I had my first interview with the Archdeacon of Nottingham, and things moved on a pace from there. Can you remember someone specifically mentioning to you, oh, I, I think God's calling you to hear, or was it, was it just a sense of God in your own heart and mind? It was a call of God in my own mm. heart. And in the era where I grew up, we were told to be a bit suspicious of someone who'd come up to you and say, God's told you, okay. God's told me to tell you. We weren't supposed to take any notice of that. And in fact, there were some people and my contemporaries who had females chasing them. God's told us we're to be married. He hasn't told me, said some of my male friends. Would you give us a little uh, summary of some of the, the places you've served, their, their different uh, contexts and perhaps joys and challenges? That's a compressing 45 years <laughs> into 45 seconds. I was ordained in Leicester Diocese in the year 1979 and served in a church there with one vicar, one curate, just to the south of the city centre. I then moved on to Sheffield Diocese into a parish that had a vicar, a church and a daughter church, two curates, and at that time a deaconess who was champing at the bit to be ordained. And finally, after I moved on from that parish, she did get to be ordained. I moved then to Kings Norton, Birmingham, into a very large parish just south of the city centre that had five worship centres, five stipendiary clergy, and a whole team of readers alongside it. And then finally moved to Chapel on the Frith, Derby Diocese, not far from Buxton. That was basically one vicar, one church, one parish. I started out with a senior assistant in a, a retired clergyman and a reader, but age and infirmity meant that I was very soon just ministering there alone for 23 years. One question I wanted to ask you, because you've served in different parishes yes. uh, throughout your ministry, um, how has that been different and challenging the different, going to a different context and being with a different church family? And how has that um, grown you and deepened your faith? Right, well I was quite young when I got, I mean I went straight through from university to theological college, so I'd be just over 30 when I went to my first living, which was in Preston, St Cuthbert's Forward. The interesting thing there was that it became vacant because the incumbent and his wife had got so ill, they had free holds so they could continue, but they had to retire because they weren't well enough to continue. He had been there for 33 years. His wife was the daughter of the vicar who was the first vicar of the parish. So altogether there had been 63 years of one family mm. in that church. It had not been an evangelical church, nor had it been high church, it was sort of middle of the way. So it was completely new ground for me and for them. And good soil for the gospel? Well, uh, they had a reasonable morning service at 10.30. 
good Sunday schools. The biggest organisation was the Scouts. Mm. There's a Scout troop belonging to the church, but they ran themselves completely independently. And I had to manage that. And uh, the church survived financially by having lotto, uh, you name it, things that, uh, you know, uh, paying something in the hope you get something more for what you did, you know, gambling in a small sense. But it really was the way in which the church lived. Mm -hmm. And I said to the wardens when I was interviewed that I noticed that this was the case and I believed that it had to stop. I said, I won't change anything for six months. But after six months, I'll ask the PCC to agree to have no more raffles or that sort of nature for fundraising for the church. Yeah. And how do you find that, making those difficult decisions um, and uh, standing up for, for the truth of the gospel um, when people are opposed to that? Well, I, I tried to prepare the ground as well as I could. There was a little pamphlet produced. There was a Bishop of Blackburn who had spoken quite clearly against any kind of gambling prior to the Second World War. I was able to dig that out. And the PCC had literature to read before we had the debate in the PCC. When I got to the actual meeting, a group of men all came in together who were belonging to the scout group, and I realised this was going to be very difficult. Mm. So I said, um, now when we come to this item, I do have a position of conscience and authority as the incumbent to say what I believe in this matter should happen. So I want to rule from this place without any discussion that the raffles will stop as far as church activity is concerned. I won't stop the Scouts from having raffles for their finances, but for the church's finances, there won't be any more after this meeting. Not easy. No, no. So, the Lord Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, forever. Over the years of your ministry, what changes have you seen in the church, in the world? And, and how do you think Christ is the yes and amen to that, or the answer and solution to those changes. The church into which I was ordained has changed beyond recognition. At the time when I went to theological college, they were looking for young, unmarried men. And women, of course, couldn't be ordained. That was just unthinkable at that time. And they didn't really like younger married men with a family. And I know I'm looking across to Jim there because it cost too much for the church to support a clergy ordinary plus wife plus maybe family. And the church has changed. The church has changed too in, the, in doing weddings, for example. 45 years ago, prospective married couples disguised every way possible that they were living together before marriage, if that were the case by giving parental addresses and so on. And now they will quite blazantly say, oh, we've lived together for six years, we've got children, we've got children with bridesmaids and page boys at our wedding. And the whole moral fabric of society has changed beyond recognition. One thought I had was to invite uh, Frieda along to ask her a question, but because she's not here, I'll, I'll ask you. Um, <laughs> how, how's it been ministering to a church family uh, and ministering to your own family? Right, well, I was ordained in 1964 in September and four weeks before I was ordained we had our first child. Mm. So we began with a baby. Um, by the time I was at St Cuthbert's I had three children and uh, we set a, a pattern at home, really. We had prayers every morning before we went off to school, a special time on a Sunday. And uh, they had little notes from Scripture Union for children growing up and so on. So it was all in that context. Yeah. They, they knew they had to fit in with what ministry demanded of them. I didn't believe in them going to a different school outside of the parish, so they went to the local schools. Um, and that was at St Cuthbert's, of course. Um, and all that was sort of breaking new ground where there'd been no gospel ministry. Mm. And my basic conviction was I was called to preach and to teach. And that's what I majored on. Um, I want to just say that uh, 
I was there from 1970, and in 1976, I planned to have a parish mission mm. in May, lasting two weeks, with a band of evangelists who I knew personally. And the response to that was such that the church was a different church mm. as a result of that. We know that to be Christian means to take up our cross daily uh, and follow Jesus. Uh, and we know that we, as Christians, will be persecuted. And this can be particularly pointed and, and obvious, highlighted as an ordained uh, minister. How have you relied on God in some of the more difficult times of parish ministry? Or, or rather, how has God sustained you through those times? I had constant battles in my former parish with atheists and secularists. They did not want the Church of England primary school to be Church of England. They wanted to be a county school. They did not want the Remembrance Sunday celebration to be in the parish church. They wanted to be out in the marketplace. And worst of all, they did not want the Derbyshire feature of Wells dressings to depict biblical scenes. And a very strident unbeliever was saying, look, we've done the Bible too many years in a row now. I propose we do Alice in Wonderland instead. Oh, yes, they all agreed. That would be wonderful. So there was stands to take, stands to say, you are a Church of England school by definition and we are not giving up the control of it and we're not giving up our foundation governors and I'm not giving up my role as ex officio foundation governors. We are holding Remembrance Sunday service in church, even if there's going to be a small breakaway group doing something in the marketplace at 11 o'clock, we are going to remember in church. And if you're going to do your Wells dressings, we're going to open up the church for a great big Christian exhibition of the heritage of faith in this town to contradict the way you're doing Alice in Wonderland with the Wells dressings. It, has there been or is there a particular scripture that you find yourself returning to that has uh, helped uh, during ministry? Well, I have a particular section of 2 Corinthians which I love from the middle of chapter 3 to the beginning of chapter 6. Mm. And in chapter 4 of that passage, uh, Paul encourages us not to look on the things that are around us, but to look to the things that are unseen, because the things that are around us are passing, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Mm. Um, so as you go forwards now, um, still standing firm in that same faith, how can we be praying for you? Well, I'm 85 now, Frida's 84 next month, or in November. Um, we're naturally finding life not as easy. Uh, we're slower at doing things than we would have been when we were younger. And we realise that uh, any serious illness is always a possibility. I've been a type 2 diabetic since I was in the 50s. Um, that's kept under control. Uh, Frida's had Hodgkin's lymphoma, which she's recovered from it. But uh, we know that we've had 61 years together, husband and wife. She knew me at school before she was a Christian, uh, but when she became a Christian, she saw me in a different light. Mm. So we've known each other an awful long time. Uh, so we really want to be in a home, in a church, part of a fellowship, mm. able to encourage and do what we can. But we're not thinking of doing anything major in terms of ministry, preaching and things yes. like that. Yeah. That's where we're at. Brilliant. We'll pray so for the you. Lord calls us. Mm, indeed. Thank you. Short question. What's your favourite hymn? That changes from time to time. But bearing in mind Timothy Dudley Smith has recently departed for eternal glory, one of his lesser known hymns I would home in on, and that would be Jesus, Prince and Saviour, a great resurrection hymn, mm -hmm. sung to the tune of um, Onward Christian Soldiers. Yeah, and thinking about Onward Christian Soldiers, now as you uh, lay down some of your uh, formal responsibilities and, and work visibly in the church, you still go on as a Christian soldier in the next stage of, of your walk with Christ. To the end and to the home call to glory. Indeed, yes. How can we be praying for you? Well, I took early retirement just before my 60th birthday. I had six <clears throat> happy and healthy years, including being honorary curate here in this church. 
But four years ago, four and a half years ago, I got hit with leukemia and I seem to have staggered on from one health issue to another, from one health appointment to another, from one hospital department to another. And I'm just never free of hospital appointments and healthcare matters anymore. And it's getting very wearying and very testing. So we'll pray for you in that, that you find uh, peace in God and strength in him. Certainly. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.